Um, thanks, Richard, and hello again, everybody. Um, uh, so this is about uh, ringing recruitment. Um, and I'm sure we've got a few war stories to tell between us all. I just wanted to share a couple of micro and macro examples in, in my recent experience. Uh, and if that hits um, target with anybody, then that's great. Um, and if anybody wants to throw in their own experiences as well, then that's super also. Um, who, who wants more learners? <laughs> Oh, oh, well, there we are. Well, that's good. Um, I've got uh, some a slide deck here, so I'm going to sort of rattle through that, and I'll be conscious of sticking to time. Richard, if you can give me a five-minute warning bell, that would be great. Will uh, do. So, uh, oh no, that's not right. So I've got to find yeah, share screen. There, I always struggle with this. Um, so let's see how we go. Share. And I'll see if I can rattle through this. So let me know when you get that slide coming. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Cool yep. Great, great, great. Well, that's a very boring first slide. Okay. Who wants more ringers? Right. Um, you're going to see this at the beginning and the end. You tell them what you're going to tell them. Then you tell them. And then you tell them what you told them. Um, anybody can recruit, in my experience. Um, your, your, you, to delegate that to one particular individual in your team. I think it, it behoves all of us to be enthusiastic about what we do uh, and share that with whoever we come into contact with. Um, it does, you know, there's a bit of effort involved, so it takes energy and enthusiasm. Uh, it's in, helpful to be creative and imaginative uh, and important to execute on your plan. Planning and preparation really help and I'll, I'll give an example of that shortly sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't work don't be disheartened if it doesn't work um it, we're in for the long haul yeah so if we don't and you know crikey here in australia you do some recruiting you start training people then there's a lockdown and everybody stops for six months and then you start again and you think oh dear here we go again that being said, there are also some amazing resources available. You don't have to do it on your own. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, there's a lot of good stuff already out there. Uh, I, I'm assuming that all of us who are here today have a tower with a band, maybe not the right size of band for what you want. Uh, Ron Shepard was asking me the other day, he says, oh, look, I've got these towers going up in Darwin. Um, how do you start recruitment from scratch, from absolute zero? Um, and I, I have no experience of that, particularly. That's, that's kind of a different topic. Is there anybody here who's in that situation? What did Singapore do? Uh, indeed, they started from scratch. And so did we. So did we. Yes. Okay, but you, but you had some folk. Uh, I mean, Sydney's got... A, 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 a wonderful range of towers, and you had folk coming to help. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Darwin is a bit further away, and you're right, Singapore, a lot further away. Um, anyway, so I, I don't think I'm really going to go down that rabbit hole. Um, I'm, I'm going to speak more to a situation where there's a tower with a certain number of ringers, but you'd like to grow the band a bit. Uh, and we can talk about starting from scratch maybe at the end if we have time. Uh, so the, the two the three examples, so a couple of micro ones, Harrow on the Hill, 10 bells over in the UK, and here in Goulburn, 13 bells, both with a one-ton tenor. Um, and then a larger one, which is sort of like a, a national slash international campaign, uh, which happened a few years ago. So we'll see if we can rattle through that. Um, I worked uh, at Harrow School from 2010 through to 2019. Um, the geography of Harrow on the Hill is it's on a hill. And the church is on the summit of the hill, um, Norman Church, 1094. So it's coming up to its, its millennium in 2094. It hasn't had bells that long. Uh, the school itself, 1572. So I was working at the school. Um, the school surrounds, so you've got the church at the summit of the hill and then the school buildings, sort of the next layer down. So they had a Duke of Edinburgh Award scheme bronze, silver, and gold. 
and um, anybody who, any kid who was completely gormless and couldn't figure out what their uh, skill was going to be, I said, look, hand them to me and I'll, you know, it's easy because it's a five minute walk up to the church and, and they can easily get a bronze and a silver and a gold. And, and you set up the targets for each of those categories and off you go. So each year, uh, we'd probably get three or four kids coming along and doing that scheme. Um, so that was that was quite handy. When I arrived at Harrow on the Hill in 2010, we were ringing doubles on the front six a lot. Uh, and by 2019, we were having 13 ringers turn up every Sunday morning, which was terrific. Really, really. Um, so as well as the young recruits, and, and of course, because it's a boarding school, you'd have them in term time, uh, but they'd all disappear in the holidays. And I would encourage them and exhort them to get involved in their local ringing communities wherever they were um, when they went home for holidays. And then when they graduated from the school and they went off to their various universities to get involved with the university um, associations and guilds, which in the UK, maybe about half of the UK universities have active ringing societies. A little bit different here in Australia. Um, and there's some good news stories which I'll, I'll say in a minute, and, and some not so good So, um, In terms of mature age recruits, uh, geographically, they tended to be locally recruited, and there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of word of mouth. So as I said right at the beginning, anybody can recruit. So I had, so I had, we had a couple of folk in the congregation at the Harrow Church, and, you know, they were always conscious of that somebody new into the congregation. You know, if you want to get involved, please consider bell ringing. Um, we had a guy who, who turned up from Zimbabwe, he emigrated. He had learnt to be a bell ringer. He was stopping with his brother and sister-in-law in Harrow, brought them along one Sunday morning. And, and, the, and the brother-in-law said, oh, this is really, he was an engineer. This is really interesting. I'd, I'd love to get involved a bit more. Uh, and he became our steeple keeper and very handy indeed. He was a graduate from St. John's County. Cambridge. So when we went off to some ringing gig in Cambridge, he organised the punts. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there were lots of word of mouth stories that worked really, really well. Um, the the one, some of the lessons learned with the, the DAB scheme. A lot of the kids they turned up just to get a tick in the box. They would sometimes do it under duress. There were bribes in the form of chocolate and sweets uh, and McDonald's. Uh, and as soon as they got the award, you know, they, they would disappear. But out of that group, we did have a couple who moved on to greater things. Um, and in fact, so we had a, a sort of brother, two brothers who went through gold, so bronze, silver and gold, um, and then moved to university and became involved in their university associations. And along the way, their mother, who was kind of their, their chauffeur, their driver, when they couldn't drive themselves, and I happened to say to her, look, you know, the kids are learning. You may as well come and learn too. And, and she did. And, and interestingly, you know, the kids have moved off to other parts of the UK and they're active in ringing in their communities there. But, but Sonia, the mother, is still active at Harrow and doing good things in, in uh, northwest London. So here's a couple of pickies. Anyway, uh, health warning, um, Harrow School, oops, sorry, is very old fashioned. So they wear these um, waistcoats and you can see the boaters on hanging up on the on the wall there. And the uniform probably hasn't changed for a couple of hundred years. But the girls there, they're not Harrow School pupils um, because it's still a boys' school, but they're local kids. Um, and they, they're there. They were very yeah, earnest young men and ladies. Um, one of the great things at Harrow, we, we got involved in the Bell Project in Ypres part of the centenary of the First World War, Alan Regan, you can see the, the tall chap on the, on the left. So he had this project. Uh, quite a few Harrow folk were killed in the First World War. He approached us saying, would we like to donate? So we did. So we donated a bell. And then we took these, now let me see if I can change this pointer. So Richard gave me a tip here, pointer options. Laser pointer. All right, so... There's Will, there's Finn, and around here you've got um, Kieran. That's the, the chaplain of the school. 
Um, and we all went off and rang our bell in, in Ypres. So the, the kids, they love, you just jump on Eurostar and off you go. Um, uh, centenary of Armistice Day, this was our Armistice Day ringing group. So again, about 13 or 14 people there, which is brilliant. This bloke here, so Nicholas Field and his mum, Sonia Field. So he's now very active in the Bath and Wells Association, Bath Abbey, et cetera. And Sonia's very, very active in Northwest London. Um, Eve is in Plymouth doing, I think, child uh, sort of primary school studies. And there they are all again. Happy days. And this is the guy who's the engineer who became our, our steeplekeeper. So there's a mix there of uh, the Harrow school boys plus local girls and the mature age folk as well. Um, this guy, Christopher Field, um, I was very proud to nominate him for college youth uh, membership. So he did very well from Duke of Edinburgh through to college youth, and now he's very active in the Nottingham area. So that was a good news story. Okay, meanwhile, Southern Highland, Southern Tablelands. Um, I arrived here at the end of 2019, a uh, core team of six when I arrived. And poor old St. Saviour's gone through the various vicissitudes since 1988 when the first bells arrived. Um, but I'm gonna stop sharing this and I'm gonna just say, you know, we had a bit of a project plan and I'll just sort of talk through, this is a resource that I'm happy to share with folk. Uh, stop share, bear with me. I'm gonna try to share another file. Bear with me, share that. And there's no harm in doing something like this. Um, so I talked about planning and preparation. So I, I approached Stephen Ralph and I, we sat down and we worked out what it is we wanted to achieve. We wanted to grow the team. Um, and these were the steps that we went through. So this is a very sort of step-by-step -step iterative process. Um, we thought, okay, costs. there might not be any costs, but there may very well be. And if there are costs, what's the budget and how are we gonna do it? If, if we need to uh, get some new brochures or trifold leaflets or anything like that, let's figure out how much money we need. Make sure we have buy-in from the church. That was absolutely crucial. Um, we, we organized a recruitment poster and a trifold brochure. Um, we agreed dates and times for taster sessions so that, you know, all this sort of preparation work, when we, by the time we got to a, um, a media release. So we approached the local newspaper, um, the local um, FM station, there's a community radio, volunteer radio station. Um, the Cathedral Newsletter, et cetera, et cetera. So we were very fortunate that we got some positive editorial from the Golden Post, front page, in fact. Um, and within that, not only could we talk about uh, what ringing is and you know the, the benefits of ringing, but also how do they take it forward? So these are the taste discussions. This is how you get in touch. Let us know that you're coming so that we had an idea about who we could expect at our taste session. Um, we also approached, let me just sort of get rid of that, Phil, hello Phil. Um, the local scouts, the local girl guides, um, a couple of high schools, University of the Third Age, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then whoever turned up, we need to make sure we had our permission form ready and then get them learning, have a commissioning service, et cetera, et cetera. So it was quite handy um, to have that plan in place, whether we had no recruits or some recruits or lots of recruits, but at least we had a plan ready and we knew what to expect. Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense. Anyway, so having a project plan works. Sorry, I've lost my pointer again. So it absolutely works to have a project plan it's always good to have favorable editorial. Um, out of all of the 
uh, aspects that we tried, the U3A was probably the least successful. Um, and there we are. So this is this group here, um, Shane, Stephen, me, Susan were existing ringers, and then Annie, Jan, uh, Paul have stuck with us. Uh, these these guys haven't stuck with us, but out of those six who turned up at the case today, we retained three, and bless them, even with lockdowns and interruptions, they've stuck with us, and it's really 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 good. We had an outing in May of this year between Canberra, Goulburn, and Yass, um, and there they are. There's Jan, there's Annie, um, and Paul over here, and a few other likely suspects. Chris, are you, are you meaning to show us your photos at this point? I'm showing photos. Can you see them? No, you're still showing the spreadsheet. Oh, you're joking. Right. Do that again. Thank you, Natalie. It's a very fine spreadsheet, nevertheless. I need you. This is really good. Um, try that. Now, are you seeing photos? Yay. Okay. All right. So these are the folk who turned up for our taster session. Uh, these three didn't stick with it, but Annie and Jan and Paul have stuck with it. And there we are doing our out into Yes, Canberra Golden. And there, look, yeah, even James was there. Okay. Thank you. All right. Third one, which is the, the macro. Uh, this was a, a national, well, I'll call it international, but it was mainly UK. Um, and it ran in 2017 to 2018, linked into the centenary of the armistice of the First World War. Um, there's, a, there's a wonderful, um, I can recommend this link here, uh, which has a 10-minute um, a video about the project. Um, basically, in the First World War, around 1,400 bell ringers lost their lives. Um, and there was a mutual approach between a community funding organisation and the UK government and ourselves, Central Council, to uh, symbolically replace those 1,400 ringers who lost their lives 100 years later. Um, and all sorts of folk came forward. It was just amazing. We had people who their grandfather or their great-grandfather had, had lost their life in the war and they wanted to commemorate, commemorate this guy and become a bell ringer. There was a particular tower in Wiltshire, Eddington Priory, where their entire team of six ringers lost their lives in the First World War. The whole team wiped out. Um, and in the meantime, Eddington got augmented. Anyway, so they, their, their team grew as a result of the campaign. There, were, there was a towers up in Shropshire where they'd been silent for a couple of decades and they got started again. Um, there were people who had nothing they, they they weren't really engaged in their local community and through this campaign they became re-engaged in their community through bell ringing um all sorts of different stories whether it was young middle age or or, or elderly so we wanted to get 1400 ringers we actually ended up with 3000 3000 and you know on some estimates there's 30,000 ringers in the world 40,000 ringers anyway it's getting close to around 10% recruitment in one year. It's flipping amazing. And so the question in my mind is, okay, as individual towers, we want to recruit individually to our tower. Absolutely, 100%, of course we do. But what could we possibly achieve if we had a national campaign? Um, if, if the right, uh, if we find the right target, if there's the right, um, motivated that, that really excites and enthuses our communities it's you know we have you know 600 members in in ANZAB at the moment what if we doubled it what would happen how if we were to double it how would we deal with that who would teach them who would train them how do we allocate them you know how do we assign them to towers and stuff like that anyway it, it was an amazing example it was a bold initiative we had no expectation whether it would work or not but it flipping well did Something amazing. Anyway, um, so those are the three examples, two micro and one macro. Um, and as I said at the beginning, here I am saying at the end, go crazy, um, have lots of energy, enthusiasm, 
reach out to your local communities, be prepared. Um, if you don't get any recruits, but if you do get some, make sure that you've got the ability to train them um, and, and then retain them. So how am I doing? 7.23. Yeah, I'm going to stop there because I wanted it to be a bit more open rather than a, a monologue from me. Yeah. No. Here we are. Um, interesting. I know, um, does, does anyone have any questions to start with? No? When it came to recruiting from school, did you have any issues with um, working with children's um, obviously the school has obligations for that kind of thing it, it, it helped you know i had the school uh, blimey i've got i think five active um working with children certificates at the moment two yeah i had two uk ones and three australian ones <laughs> so was it did everyone in the tower have to have one or is it just no the... no the ones okay so the language that they used was um uh, frequency and intensity. So if you had frequent contact with young vulnerable people, and if it was very close contact with young vulnerable people, and all the dumb stuff, like if you're driving somebody to and from, then make sure you've got at least two adults, et cetera, et cetera, or, at, of which one, at least one had to be um, child protection check. Right. Hmm. And same in the tower. So there had to be at least two adults one of whom had to be child protection check. Yeah, the rules might be slightly different here, but that, that, that's just something we need to check. I mean, the, the rules are out. Well, there, yeah, I mean, there's plenty of schools next to bell towers in Australia, so it's definitely a, a resource that should be tapped. Um, and, and indeed, if you, if you can get, whether it's a maths teacher or a music teacher, you know, who, who has an an aptitude or an interest in bell ringing that helps and then if you have a parent so here in Goulburn we've got we've got a mum and two kids who are learning um and that was a bizarre situation um with with Winston bless him the kelpie um we're out dog walking and here's Georgina with her kelpie and you know we're having doing a bit of a have a chat down at the dog park and you know she said oh this bell ringing thing sounds interesting I'd like to come along can I bring my kids and uh, so that's going quite well. Is there a recommended um, youngest age um, for a recruit? I suppose it's more about physique rather than an, a nominal age. Nominally, I'd probably, I wouldn't teach anybody under 10. Um, but also they, they need to be physically able to handle the weight of bells that you've got, you know, so whether it's, you know, Naramburn or Monica with, with, with lighter bells, you could probably teach younger folk. Um, at, you know, at the cathedrals or at heavier bells, you probably wouldn't teach anybody who hasn't got the physique for it. Interesting that a lot of, well, yeah, a lot of the examples that you had, so new to micro examples, um, and to an extent, I think also the UK question because the 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 war thing didn't catch on here in the same way obviously that wasn't the right motivation for here but they worked really well you were often drawing on the local community and that was something that you'd emphasized in your talk that you go to the people near where you are so if you've got you know if you've got a tower in a town go to that town you know you've got the school nearby or you've got the the, the you know the various sort of interest groups or whatever I think there's a there's maybe an extra challenge associated with towers that don't really have a local community in the same way. So for example, all the city towers, the cathedrals and the um, and the church and the churches that are in the city, certainly in Sydney, um, they don't really have a geographical community in the same way that the two examples that you gave did. I was just wondering if you've got any suggestions as to Yeah, I mean to reach so out I, th I think I think we've all come to the acknowledgement that approaching your parish community um, is, is fairly limited these days. Um, the demographic that you get in the parish might not be uh, ideal. And, and I get, so for instance, I'm not sure if, if, if the Bexley project is, is progressing, but um, you know, the, 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 and, and what's the demographic in Bexley? If, it's, if they're not sort of 
kind of aware of the, the tradition of English chain drinking, you might be pushing a bit of an uphill barrel. Um, but then I've also, there are some target audiences that we might miss. So let's say you, you do something, unta it might be targeted geographically, like a letterbox drop. So let's say you, you're up in St. James Taramara. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you wouldn't, it, it wouldn't hurt to go and do a letterbox drop in, in the couple of blocks around there. Mm -hmm. um, geographically, that might not, if people are sort of more mobile and so they're not at home enough, um, there are other groups. So, I mean, the Girl Guides were a bit of a flop, but lo and behold, this thing called Girls Brigade still exists. I didn't realise that. Um, but uh, boy, so Stephen Fox and Taramara, he used to be in Boys Brigade, and that's how he got into bell ringing. Uh, Girls Brigade here in Goulburn isn't with the Anglican Church, it's actually with the Baptists. Um, and one of our mature age learners is one of the leaders of Girls Brigade, and she we, she brought her group along because they were desperate for activities to do in their program. And I said, well, how about a tower to it? And they said, oh, yeah, brilliant, bring it on. So we had a dozen, you know, screaming teenage girls um, doing backstrokes. <laughs> and uh, so we're now we're, we're kind of inventing a Girls Brigade badge um, that they'll be able to do. On a similar subject to that, you mentioned with the Duke of Edinburgh that you set goals for your gold, silver, and for your bronze, silver, and gold. Um, at St Mary's, we were sort of we're looking to maybe um, tap into a Duke of Edinburgh program with the local school, and we were wondering what sort of um, attainments would would make yeah, sense I've, to I've set. Well, actually, okay, I've, I've joined this at the right time because I was actually at, um, being Central Council Rep for Anzo. I was actually at the last meeting and this very thing was discussed. Uh, the Central Council are actually going to come up with um, some renewed suggestions for the Duke of Edinburgh specifically about those sort of levels. So um, uh, uh, Colin uh, Newman, uh, is, uh, his team are working on it. So um, I've always said, hey, let us know when you've done it. Um, so we can distribute that around. So that's something that the Central Council is looking at right now. Cool. You've reminded me, Natalie, and, and Pete, I'll, I'll share this with you as well, that we, we had a situation at St Mary's Cathedral where um, the, the Christian Brothers School next door is, is a feeder for the cathedral choir. Um, so kids get scholarships to be to school if they're in the choir. And we, and we used to see these parents and, and younger siblings hanging around while their boy was singing. And these are the kids who didn't qualify for the scholarship. And we say, what are you doing here? They say, oh, my brother's in the choir. I'm not, I've got to twiddle my thumbs. So why, why don't you come and have, have a ring? So we had this sort of the, the, the choir hangers on, the choir groupies who, who were at a bit of a loose end. And we said, well, come and join the other lot. <laughs> mm. Like to get a <laughs> yeah, we should have offered a scholarship. Yeah, yeah. I like you too about um, tapping into parents as well. That was something that I hadn't thought of. You know, if you've got kids coming in, whether through a Duke of Edinburgh program or whatever, it's um, they, the parents are potentially a. I think Colin's quite good about it, Lynn. And, uh, and, 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 it, and, and it helps tick the box with the you know, child safety and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> On the Duke of Edinburgh, I had a question. We've got some huge. Sorry, Bill. Um... Who's next? I believe I'm next. Um, so I just have the little warning saying saying my internet's unstable, but hopefully you can oh all hear God. me. Well, so there were two people asking a question at the same time. And, and yeah. now oh, sorry, stopped. sorry. Okay, no. uh, I, I, was, I was yielding to Bill. Me, I didn't say anything. All oh, right. Sorry. No, that's it. Yeah. This is Fabry. Was, uh, ah, sorry. Halfway through. I was just um, talking about this huge um, growth in population in Orange. Given me an idea because they're all putting houses in um, new settlements. I think stuff like that might be worthwhile. Yeah, indeed. Well, Orange will be 
similar. So in Goulburn, I stumbled across a Facebook group called Goulburn Newbies. Um, and it's about people who've done the tree change thing yeah. and they're looking to integrate into a new community. And uh, there you are. There's going to be a Facebook group called Orange Newbies or something similar. And uh, they'll, they'll welcome you with open arms. Yeah. I was, I was going to say, um, in Bristol, we had quite a lot of success with Open Doors Day, which is something that, um, that happens in Sydney, or at least used to. Um, yeah. I, I don't know how, how many people tap into that. I know St. Mary's used to, used to have the, the tower open. But, um, yeah, what, what was this? Any, any sort of um, analysis of conversion from in, uh, visitor to learner? I think it was I pretty was, low. Was, You'd pretty get one, low. One, one, one We've got two. Margaret still. <laughs> ah, there oh, we are then. We've got Margaret. Yeah. But, but it's interesting because I think one of the, yeah, it's, it's kind of catch me too, isn't it? Because if you really want to get people there, I mean, the, the sort of tasters you were proposing where people actually get a chance at having their hands on a rope at, yep. on the day, that would be great. But our open towers were much too big to be doing that, really. I mean, we, we were sort of fielding 30 people in the tower at a time, and so there wasn't really an opportunity for that. Exactly. Interesting if we could find some way of, of having like an open open day that that did give sort of people some chance of getting a, a taste of it. Yeah, and and um, a couple of other things we've done here in Goblin, we've reached out from outside the tower walls. So up the road from here is a, an old historic um, steam powered waterworks. And they have uh, steam fairs every you know, twice a year kind of thing. So we turned up there and did a handbell display with some brochures. And we got a learner out of that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and in March next year, we're hoping to get the, uh, the mini ring from Queensland for the same kind of idea. And you get people on the end of a rope and they have a real buzz. Mm -hmm. Well, we're at five minutes over time. Um, so unless anyone's <laughs> got anything else to, to add or ask. Yeah, I'm, I'm leaving now. Thank you, Richard. Right. And thanks, Christopher. It was very good. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Great, great talk and um, yeah. quite a nice discussion.